that is a moment of change when you decide to take the action to write the things down. Well, because you're getting it out of your head. Yeah. And you're bringing it into the real world. And when you put it on a piece of paper, it is suddenly not a problem that you're thinking about. It's a problem that you can work on. And it becomes concrete instead of something that bothers you. And the cool thing about being a human being is that you're a natural problem solver. Mm -hmm. And if you see that list of things that are causing you friction in your business, it's a gift because those are just all problems to solve. There's nothing personal about this. It's just like, just look at it like, oh, well, this is cool. These are all the things that aren't working. And here's the other thing. Maybe it's not working because you're meant to do it a different way. I just want to welcome Mel Robbins to the Entrepreneur Studio. Thank you so much for making the trek. Oh my gosh. Thanks for inviting me. All the way out here in, uh, you know, Oklahoma City, you made the trek. I, I, I will say um, you're not, you know, too uh, unfamiliar with rural areas. Yes? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, this isn't rural. We're in, we're in you know, at least downtown. This is way bigger than where I live. Okay. I live in a town of 3,000 3, people in Southern Vermont. And I grew up in a town of 3,000 people in Western Michigan. Oh my gosh. So you're used to it. Yep. All right. Well, we want to learn uh, quite a lot uh, about you. I will say that you've had kind of a, let's say a winding path leading to where you are today. You've been a defense attorney, you know, a CNN analyst, best-selling author, motivational speaker, podcaster. Um, you know, tell us at the kind of like this pivotal moment that you had in your life to kind of devote yourself to helping other people. Um, well, I thought you were going to ask me, what is the pivotal moment for every change? And I was going to say, it was usually one of these moments of, I hate what I'm doing. I want to, <laughs> I want to change now. And I think one of the coolest things about the times that we live in and in being a business owner, particularly a small business owner, is there's so much opportunity that wasn't even there 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. So really paying attention to those moments when you're starting to feel a lot of friction or you're not as engaged with what you're doing. That is such an important moment in life because there is wisdom inside you trying to tell you mm -hmm. that it's time for a pivot. In terms of uh, getting involved in personal development and all of the research and the projects that we're doing now from the podcast to books to the stuff that we do with companies, you know, like you guys yeah. is um, like all things in my life, Everything seems to be the result of me either digging a hole for myself and falling into it or not noticing a hole in front of me and tripping into it. And I tend to find myself in these situations. And this is certainly the case with my uh, path into personal development and writing all the books and doing all the research that I do. I was at a moment in my life that you listening will probably relate to. I hope not because of personal experience, mm -hmm. but my husband had followed a dream to go into the restaurant business. So my husband had gotten laid off and decided he was not going to look for a job, but he was going to follow his dream, Chris, of going into the restaurant business. Now, if you're in the restaurant business and you're listening to me right now, you just took a gigantic, oh boy, mm -hmm. because there's only two kinds of people that go into the restaurant business people who are forced to because their family's in the restaurant business or people who typically haven't worked in one, but think it's going to be absolutely amazing. <laughs> and I grew up working in the restaurant business. I mean, I had a job uh, when kids could have paper routes for crying out loud. And so I was in the front of the house, the back of the house. I was a fry cook. I've been a bartender. I've been a waitress. And so when Chris said this, I'm like, you're out of your mind. And, you know, I got to hand it to him. He really pushed and pushed and pushed and convinced me that he and his best friend could raise money and open a restaurant in 18 months flat, which was exactly how much money we had left in our savings to live on. And they did it. And the first one was a home run, but what happened, and this happens so much, particularly in retail stores, as you know, it is location, location, location. Yeah. And it is the formula, formula, formula. And when you stray from your location strategy or the formula that made one location a success, you can invite disaster. And so the second location was a dog 
And we like complete idiots had cashed out our uh, life savings and took out credit cards and got a home equity line and found ourselves 800 grand in debt. Went all in. Oh my God. And I don't know if anybody knows the word factoring, but it got so desperate. I know you're, you're just going, Mel, that should be illegal. Yes, it should. Um, but they were scrambling to do anything because fa- friends and family had invested. And so I found myself at the age of 41, I had lost my job. This was 2008. So the housing market was upside down. We also happened to get five nor'easters in the New England area that winter. And what that means for a retail business, they all hit on the weekend. Oh gosh. Closed for five, closed for five weekends, three days in one quarter. And so they were hemorrhaging money that we didn't have. Chris hadn't taken a salary in six months. We had three kids under the age of 10. And I found myself in this situation where the problem seemed so overwhelming. I became a person I didn't recognize. Mm. I could barely get out of bed. I was hitting the snooze button four or five times a morning. The kids were missing a bus. I was so angry at Chris and I faced this moment like a high functioning adult. And that is by drinking myself into the ground and blaming everything on him. And the truth is, while it was his and his partner's business, you know, I had been a complete willing participant and cheerleader until things went terrible. Mm. And then of course, you know, I went against him. And it was during this moment where we were literally going to lose everything that I cared deeply about. We were going to lose each other. The family was going to be torn apart. We were going to lose our home. I was slowly losing my sanity. And the simple things that I knew I should or could do seemed out of reach, like asking for help or even calling my parents and telling them what was going on or being kind to Chris Mm -hmm. or just getting out of bed and facing the day. And it was during this moment that I was sitting in my living room. So it would have been February, 2008. And I was kind of at my lowest point, I'm sitting there having uh, this kind of talk with myself. Mm. And those moments are really a pathetic moment. Like Chris, it's one thing if I'm giving you advice, but if I'm sitting alone in my living room, having a conversation out loud with myself, (laughs) things are- Just that little detail of out loud, that's uh, that definitely sends it to another level. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and you're like, that's it. Tomorrow, it's the new you. Tomorrow, you gotta pull yourself together, woman. Tomorrow you have to, and and I'd been having this talk for a while, but there was something about the talk tonight. You got to pick up the phone. You got to look for a job. You got to start to fight. And by God, woman, when that alarm rings, you can't lay there in that bed like a human pot roast marinating in fear. You got to get up. And then all of a sudden, it's like it was a sign from God, this uh, rocket ship launched across the TV screen. And it gave me this crazy idea. Huh. What if I just launched myself out of bed like a rocket? Now, I always joke that uh, I'd had four bourbon Manhattans that night. So that's probably what inspired the idea because it sounds kind of dumb. But that singular moment changed my life. And I do believe you're one decision away from a different life. And the very next morning, Tuesday morning, February 2008, outside of Boston, Massachusetts, um, was this moment where I saw something that I had never seen before that is a universal experience that every single human being has all day long. And it is a moment of hesitation. And here's what happened. So the alarm went off and I immediately remembered the idea of launching myself out of bed. But then I hesitated. And this is what we all do. And the moment you hesitate and you stop and think about not what you should do, but whether or not you feel like doing it. Mm -hmm. In that moment of hesitation and consideration, all of a sudden, self-doubt, procrastination, anxiety, excuses, fatigue, worry, beat down, whatever it is that is the thing that sabotages you, that's when it comes in. And as I started to notice this, like, because I literally was like, oh, wow, I know I should get out of bed, but I don't feel like it. And I had a million excuses. That's the other thing. There will always be an excuse not to do something. Absolutely. And I had a million of them. And um, I started to notice the more that I laid there and thought about launching myself out of bed, the less I felt like doing it. 
And I don't know what came over me, but I just started counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one. And there was something about this counting backwards, just like NASA does, that interrupted the excuses, interrupted the thinking. And all of a sudden I stood up. And so I started to use this little countdown thing in secret and it worked for everything. Whether I wanted to like uh, pick up the phone and call somebody to network for a job because I need a job, right? Yeah. And knowing what you need to do, and this is kind of one of the major takeaways for you listening, knowing what you need to do, that's like the booby prize. That's mm -hmm. like step one of a marathon. You have to know how to make yourself do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And particularly in business, one of the things that we're going to talk a lot about is that if you were to divide your business into income producing activities <laughs> and all the other crap, yeah, we can get so focused on all the other crap that we don't force ourselves to do the things that actually grow your business. Well said. And so the five second rule, which I started to call it, because it's very similar to dropping food on the floor, right? So if you drop food on the floor, that old myth is that you got to pick it up in five seconds or else the floor contaminates the food. Mm -hmm. If you think about something for more than five seconds, your brain contaminates your will to take action. And what I learned using this little strategy in secret, five, four, three, two, one, go, five, four, three, two, one, go, five, four, three, two, one, take a pause, don't scream at him. 54321, pick up the phone. 54321, just send the email. 54321, don't overthink it. Do it. I started to notice that what I was doing is I was starting to interrupt and override this pattern of hesitating and this pattern of self doubt and this pattern of procrastination. And I was encoding a new pattern. Psychologists call this the difference between having a bias towards thinking versus a bias towards action. And if you're in a mode in your life where you're stressed or you're overwhelmed or you're kind of, I think a lot of us business owners feel like the second the day starts, we're on the defense, we're in reaction mode. If you're in that kind of mode in your life, which is exactly how I felt when we were facing bankruptcy yeah. and the liens hit the house, I was in defense and reaction you can get trapped in overthinking. And the only thing that changes your life or your business or your mindset or your health or your relationships is action. It's the only thing. Mm -hmm. And I believe that as you're sitting here listening to this conversation, that in the area of your life or business where you're struggling or you're frustrated, I guarantee you, you know what you could or should do to just get started or to just move in a different direction. If you don't know what you could or should do, here are two suggestions, Google, <laughs> and just do the first thing that comes up because it'll move you in a different direction Yeah. or do the opposite of what you're doing right now yeah. and just try that for one day. We know the action that could change the trajectory of things. The issue isn't knowledge. It's that you hesitate and then the way that your brain works is that if you hesitate for long enough, you will not do it. Yeah. And so that was the beginning of my turn into this incredible, uh, I don't even know what to call it. Like I've been doing this now since 2008, uh, 15 years. It happened organically. Like I didn't have this epiphany, Chris, that was like, oh, I've invented this thing that helps me get out of bed. How do I write a book about it and make mm -hmm. millions? Of that? that was not it at all. I was trying to save myself from ruining my life. Yeah. And I didn't know how to take action. I was so stuck in this moment. I was so stuck in this experience that everybody gets stuck in, which is knowing what you need to do, but feeling so frustrated with yourself because you can't make yourself do it. I mean, how many times in business have you been in a situation where you know you need to, like for a lot of you, you need to start getting more serious about social media, but you can't get yourself to do it. Mm -hmm. You get so sucked into the day-to-days or that there are phone calls you need to make. Maybe there are 10 cold calls you need to make. Maybe it's getting yourself into a mastermind group. You know you need to do this thing, but you can't get yourself to do it. And it's also there with health. 
I mean, if I asked you, do you know what you need to do? One change you could make that would make you healthier. You'd say, yes, I, I need to drink less. I need to eat less bread. I need to walk a little bit more. I need to get more bright light. You know, There's we all list. know. Yeah, I, I could get better sleep. I could stop laying in bed and looking at my phone. All the, Knowing that stuff doesn't make you do it. And so I started to realize I had discovered this tool mm -hmm. that was helping me cut through the noise in my head and just get to work yeah. in my life, in my business, all of it. And so that was really the beginning of it. And I think one of the things that I'm really proud of is that I have never veered away from this original idea that absolutely anybody can change their life for the better. But you have to be willing to put your head down and wake up every day and chip away at it. And at the heart of everything that I do is this belief that you can create a better life. And so I have been maniacally focused on figuring out how do you create simple shortcuts, mm -hmm. simple little tools that are backed by science and research that could work for anybody. And, you know, I, that's what's really driven all of this. And I've also had this huge focus on trying to make as much of what I do completely free and available to absolutely anybody anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And keeping that focus is what has not overnight, but over time led to where we are now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of people are just now starting to discover me because we have 10 million followers online. We have a monster YouTube channel in terms of watch hours. We have this massive podcast. It's been out for less than a year. And so people are now discovering, they're like, wow, how'd you do this overnight? I'm like, dude, it's 15 years. Yeah, it took it's 15 years to be an overnight yeah, success. It's therapy. It is uh, making tons of mistakes. It's working a hundred hours a week. Um, because I don't even consider what I do work. I consider it a calling. Yeah. Uh, the thing that is, I'd say the magic in uh, that thing that you described where you've got uh, suffering and hardship and then you're having the conversation with yourself, which you may have had before, right? Mm -hmm. But for some reason, you kind of grabbed onto this tool that all of a sudden it it you, you made a different decision and it created a different trajectory. And it's kind of like the, the analogy of, you know, uh, a ship with no wind in its sails can't turn. You know what I mean? Oh, it's true. You, it ha you got to have, you got to have some movement in order to go a different direction. That's, yeah. uh, the, the magic in that though, you could have gone a, you could have stayed in the mire and the muck, but for oh some God, reason yeah. you chose a different path that sent you in a totally different direction. And you helped yourself and you're helping a lot of people along the way. Yeah. You know, I, um, I think a lot about that moment, that Tuesday morning in 2008, because had I made a different decision, my life would have gone in a different direction. Exactly. I'd be bankrupt, probably divorced, probably an alcoholic. Um, family would have been torn apart. And, you know, I don't know why it happened that morning. You know, I, I tend to, because there are so many miracles and so many just magical things that have opened up and happened that I truly believed that I, that I was just meant to do it. I was the one that was going to take this stupid, simple idea and pound it into people's heads around the world that number one, you're one decision away from a different life. And number two, if you count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, you manually switch gears in your mind and you move from thinking to doing, and it really is that simple. And I do think particularly for business owners, because we're driven people. Mm -hmm. We have a lot on our plate. Um, there's a lot of us that also have ADD and dyslexia. That's why we're prone to being entrepreneurs because we're creative thinkers. Um, that we are analytical. We are idea people. That's why you're in the business. Mm -hmm. And that is an important thing for ideation, but it can really get in your way when it comes to execution. Yeah. Execution's everything. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that uh, was really awesome, just kind of trying to, um, I'd say, distill this, uh, I, everything that you've done, this arc of going from understanding yourself, understanding people and having a platform to help. I was like, man, she, she the, the amount of things that you've experienced and the amount of discovery that's happened has really created this platform that's helping people every day. But I, I think that this idea that you had of 
um, you know, sort of action, there's clouded intuition in there. And that's one of the things like, as you've sort of understood people and you've done research, this knowing what to do, why, it, why is it so cloudy for people? Why is it, why the hesitation? Why the procrastination? Why the, I'm not sure. I'll tell you why. Because your intuition gets more and more clouded and hidden, the less you act on it. See, mm -hmm. every morning that you wake up, let's just take a super simple example, because you'll be able to use this countdown technique in absolutely every aspect of your business. You'll be able to use it to go five, four, three, two, one, and take a deep breath before you yell at all the line cooks because it's a busy night and everybody's slow and to approach it a different way. You'll be able to go five, four, three, two, one, and pick up the phone call and start making cold calls that you've been avoiding. Um, <clears throat> let's take the example of the moment the alarm rings in the morning and getting out of bed. The alarm represents intuition. It's like a call, yeah. right? You can feel it. It's a knowing. And your instincts are always dead on. They're not leaving you. They're hardwired into your natural intelligence. It's part of this inner compass that you have. But you can become disconnected to it if every single time your intuition says you should make that call and you hesitate and then you don't, you're training yourself not to listen to it. And so intuition, I think a lot of us don't understand that it's in acting on the intuition that you make your intuition louder and clearer and more accurate. And if you go back to this simple example, I mean, just try this tomorrow morning, set your alarm for a half an hour earlier than you normally do. If you're the kind of person that can spring out of bed, if you're like the rest of us, I still struggle to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of, I think I have really low cortisol in the morning. I think I finally figured it out, but, um, I don't like getting out of bed. It is what it is. I love my bed. I love my sheets. I love how warm it is. I love that my husband's there. I just love all of it. I don't want to get out of bed. Never have, never will. And so I just have to do it. Like you can do things that you don't want to do. You don't have to feel like it. Waiting to feel like it is a losing bet. And so I, the alarm rings and just notice when the alarm rings tomorrow morning, if you set your alarm a half an hour earlier, that there is a moment where you stop and consider whether or not you want to get out of bed. You will know in your bones that you had set your alarm 30 minutes earlier. And by setting your alarm 30 minutes earlier, you had made a promise to yourself. Mm -hmm. When that alarm rings, it is time to keep the promise, but you're going to hesitate on that. And so getting out of bed isn't about waking up. It isn't about rolling out of bed. It's about keeping a promise that you made. And when you do that, the alarm rings. I know I should get up. I get up. You just strengthened your intuition. When you, for example, have somebody that works for you and you just know something's off, but you're nervous because either if you're a small business, you know, how am I going to find somebody else? What am I going to do? Exactly. But you don't address it. Like that's the problem. You don't address it. You let it slide. You let it slide. You don't say anything. You let the resentment build up. You, your intuition's right. The issue is you're not acting on it. Um, they can certainly, I'm sure, call you guys and get advice about what to do, right? Yeah. About like how you handle this, how you document things. You're not on your own on these things, but you have this moment of intuition and then you don't act on it because of this hesitation. And so your intuition, your business instincts, your life instincts, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. If you simply start acting on it and you can start practicing this by getting out of bed when the alarm rings. Yeah. And that really, that action takes some courage from time to time. Yeah. And you know, courage is not some big thing. Courage is a tiny thing in your life. You know, we make the mistake of thinking that courage is reserved for jumping off a cliff or uh, stepping in front of the, en the enemy army. Mm -hmm. The enemy army is your critic. It's your hesitation. It's your self-doubt. It's the incessant worrying about stuff that hasn't happened yet and how that robs you of time, attention, and energy. Mm -hmm. That's the battle you're fighting every day. And so courage every single day looks like doing things you don't feel like doing trying something new, taking a risk, leaning into your intuition, having the hard conversation. 
It's not okay that you're on the phone while you're at the register. I realize that we're slow, but you could be uh, doing something else. Here's the list of 18 things like cleaning tables, Mm -hmm. checking the trash in the bathroom, standing on your phone is not in the job description. Give, then that's giving feedback. Yes. You don't have to be a dick like I <laughs> yeah, just was, but yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like it just, it, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like how often, and you know, I don't think a lot of people realize this, but my husband and I, we had a little paint your own pottery retail store where we had all kinds of employee issues, issues, including somebody walking into it one day with people painting, like with their kids Yeah. and our employee was in the bathroom hooking up with her boyfriend like there are all kinds of things that, that my husband and I have dealt with. I come from a long line of uh, farmers that had farm stands and produce distribution businesses. My dad was a doc, but had his own PT clinic mm-hmm. and did a ton of volunteering and created a clinic in um, a rural area. My mom had a, a retail kitchen store. So I grew up in the retail small business. My grandparents uh, on my dad's side had a family bakery in Chatham, New Jersey. Wow. I mean, this is in my blood. Yeah. And so I understand that it's a 24 seven job. I understand that there are a bazillion things that you're always thinking about, but the thing that I want to get to you is that you can get so mired in the thinking that you don't act on the five things every day that actually drive your business forward. And that's what has really helped me when it comes to the five second rule is that there's a million things I could be doing in my business, but I wake up every day and I say to myself, what are the things that I need to do Mm. today? And what can I put in, you know, a lot of people call it a parking lot, a parking lot. You can put it over the parking lot. I like to call it a shopping list because a parking lot sounds like we're not going to get to it. Mm. I call it my team. I did not name that. My team named it. Let's create a shopping list for Mel. Everything she'd like to do that is completely not relevant to what we need to do. It goes on the shopping list. And when we have free time, Mel can go browse the shopping list Mm -hmm. and we can decide if we're going to take these things on. And I say that's a condition for ideators as well. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, you got to have the shopping list. You got to have, we, you know, uh, we call it a backlog or a parking lot. Yeah. But um, I have the same condition. Well, here's another tip that will really help. And I know this is not about the five second rule, but I am a humongous fan of those huge sticky post-it notes that you can put on the wall. Just stick one of those next to your desk. And every time you have a great idea, stick it up there. Yeah. That way you can see it. You know that it is somewhere in the world. And then five, four, three, two, one, turn your face back to the screen or back to the thing that you need to do. But that has helped me a lot with a way to take those ideas that come up because that's how my mind work and throw them there and not hold it in my mind. Yeah. I mean, the thing that I, I love about what you're talking about, you're basically talking about rewriting your autonomic nervous system. You know, you're like re imprinting, rewriting to get yourself to sort of be committed to change and finish and do the thing that you've always imagined. Yeah. And, you know, I think w- one thing that, that I am proud of myself for it took me a long time to get here. I'm going to be 55 this year is I stopped fighting against my nature and I started to figure out how can I outsmart myself? Mm. Like, instead of getting frustrated that I have all these ideas and I distract myself and I'll, okay, Let's just accept that as fact. How can I outsmart myself? One is a post-it note. That's one thing that I do up on the wall all the time. The second thing that I do a lot around outsmarting myself is if I have to do deep work, I don't ever do it at my desk. Mm -hmm. You know, people are like, turn off notifications. It doesn't work for me because I'll just go click on the email when I like stop and then I'll just bring it right up. I know myself. I'll go down to the kitchen and work have to leave my phone upstairs because I will look at it. So instead of making myself wrong, like I should be some sort of neuroscientist, super geek that can sit and just focus, focus, focus. I have to outsmart my own nature. Mm -hmm. And so I use a tremendous number of, you know, what the research calls environmental triggers, post-it notes, alarms on my phone, changing the environment that I'm in. Um, And I think having that kind of approach where are you an execution person or are you an ideation person? Mm -hmm. 
and really embracing that, it is liberating because you stop trying to make yourself do everything. And that was a big mistake that I made for a long time where I did not focus on hiring people that could execute. Being an ideator, I tended to surround myself with other people who had ideas. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it feels fun to sit like we're all popcorn popping ideas. Exactly. But then nothing- There's an energy there. Yes, but nothing then was getting handled. So anyway, kind of I mean, that's all chasing the spark. That's what I call that. Like, you know, there's always the idea, the energy's there. You're chasing the spark. You're all excited about it. Um, but the progress doesn't ever show up. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. one, one of the things we talk about often is, uh, is surrounding yourself with a, a team of people, right? You got your producer, people that get stuff done and we'll call it yep. the lines to do it. Your entrepreneur is the ideator. Great yep. to collaborate with, doesn't get anything done. The integrator, right? That's going to connect people or connect systems. And then your administrator who's got the checklist. Where right? were you 10 years ago? I, I don't know. You, you could know. have saved me so much time and energy. <laughs> Listen, even I, marriage counseling. For I'm that the matter. ideator. And I'm like, I will get nothing done if I don't have my producer and my, my, my administrator around me. Well, and I think the hardest thing, cause this is a question that I'm sure you guys get a lot is who do you hire first? Mm, it's a good question. I think you have to know who you are first and what your weakness is. And, you know, one of the things that I made a big mistake around because everything just started to take off so quickly about 10 years ago is that I just needed help. So, oh, Chris, you just got me a coffee. Would you like to run digital marketing strategy? (laughs) Um, uh, You know, I I can, can just use anybody. And so a couple things on that, because, you know, you may be listening and you might be a solo printer. Mm-hmm. Um, the, one of the most important leaps that you will ever make in your business is when you take a pay cut in order to expand your capacity. And so if you're thinking like, I got it, I got to scale. The first question I would say you should ask yourself is what, if I could focus my day on one or two things that would grow the business, what would it be? And write those one or two things down. Everything else, there is your list of what you need to hire somebody else to do. Because, you know, my um, business partner and COO, CFO came from a much, much larger company, probably 10 times the size. And um, she always says, our most valuable asset in this company is your time and energy mail. And so we protect it at all costs because there is not another person in my company that could sit here and do this interview with you. Mm -hmm. There's not another person in my company that could host the Mel Robbins podcast. There's not another person that is gonna show up uh, with any of the major brands that we deal with and create custom content and and, uh, productions for that could close the deal. And that means that's my job. That's my seat on the bus. There are 50,000 other things that need to go in a company like my size. And I should not be in those seats. I don't have the expertise. It's not what I do. And so the best thing that I could tell any of you that's like, I'm drowning is go, okay, what actually grows your business? Do you need to be the one in the store every day? Do you need to be the one that is, uh, you know, working the line. Do you need to be the one? If you weren't there and you replaced yourself with somebody who could probably do it better than you, what would you spend your time on that actually either made you more profitable or got you more time back or made uh, what you're doing more efficient or better or that made you more money? Mm -hmm. That's how you do it. And it's the scariest moment because you've kind of gotten to this point where things are going and you think that they're gonna keep going if you just keep going. No, 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 no. Those moments um, when you feel friction. I have a really, really good friend named Peter Sheehan who is uh, just like a genius business strategist. And he uh, wrote a book called Mattering, or Matter, I think it is. And um, I remember when he sat me down and he said, you know, the more successful you get, Mel, the more miserable you are. And he goes, we gotta change that. And he had me do this very simple exercise. He said, take out a piece of paper, draw a line down the center, 
And on the left-hand side, I want you to write absolutely everything about what you're doing that creates friction in your life and in your body. And by friction, you know what I mean. It's that like in your body. And let me tell you, I like poured it all down on a piece of paper. I hate getting on an airplane on a Sunday. I hate not being able to get home. I like, and it was like, hate, 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 hate. And it became very clear that the way that I was running my business was not working Mm -hmm. anymore. And then he wrote, write down absolutely everything that you love. And so I started writing all these things down that I loved doing that brought me joy that were part of the business. Like this isn't just like some go find a unicorn exercise. This is really get to the heart of what is aligned for you. And that became a roadmap that I followed for two years to make a huge pivot in our business so that I could spend more time doing the things that naturally felt good. And I could figure out how to change the business model and the team so that the things that naturally brought me friction could be handled by somebody who loved doing that kind of stuff. And look, this is after 10 years of building this business. This is not what happens when you're the entrepreneur and you're the one person running a retail store. Okay. So I need, I need to just say that this comes with time, but you can even do that now. You can figure out, are there aspects of your business that you could get a high schooler intern to do for you? Are there aspects of your business that you could hire one person to do that would free you up both time? And here's the most important one, energy. Mm -hmm. Because if you're frustrated walking into your business, here's the other thing that was a really hard lesson for me. As an entrepreneur and a leader, and a leader is, how I define a leader is, If you have an impact on other people, you are a leader, which means you listening are a leader. You're a leader in your family. You're a leader in your neighborhood. You're a leader uh, wherever you work because your behavior impacts people. And there's a saying that leaders bring the weather. And it's true. From an energy standpoint, you bring the weather. And if you wake up on on a sunny day, there is something about just seeing the sun that slightly shifts your energy. If you wake up on a rainy day, it has been raining all summer in Southern Vermont. It's like, oh, another day of rain. It changes your energy. You have to really start to think about your energy because if you feel a lot of friction in your business, you are fighting against your own energy and your mm-hmm. own business. Mm-hmm. That everything you just talked about is too, that, that's all the clutter that you just talked about the writing things down and I think uh, one of the things that gets really distracting as an entrepreneur, even as a person is, you know, if you, if you really forget your why, mm. and there's a lot of feelings got us to our why, yep. um, but a lot of action, you know, is, is what's going to carry us forward. There's a clearing of the clutter that that exercise of writing it down did. And that right there is the, the moment you start working on your business. Yeah. Right. You can get really distracted with all the things in your business. But the second you decide to go, okay, I'm going to get all the clutter out. Here's everything that has friction. These are all the problems. I'm going to get it all out. Yeah. That's when you start working on the business. And that is almost like the five second rule in the sense that that is a moment of change when you decide to take the action to write the things down. Well, because you're getting it out of your head. Yeah. And you're bringing it into the real world. And when you put it on a piece of paper, it is suddenly not a problem that you're thinking about. It's a problem that you can work on. And it becomes concrete instead of something that bothers you. And the cool thing about being a human being is that you're a natural problem solver. Mm -hmm. And if you see that list of uh, things that are causing you friction in your business, It's a gift because those are just all problems to solve. There's nothing personal about this. It's just like, just look at it like, oh, well, this is cool. These are all the things that aren't working. And here's the other thing. Maybe it's not working because you're meant to do it a different way. Mm -hmm. Maybe like things feel hard because you're approaching it wrong. Mm -hmm. And so how cool, let's circle back to your intuition, that your intuition, which is showing up as friction and frustration over and over and over again. And I want to be clear about something. I'm not talking about the frustrations that happen 
once or twice. You have a customer that's super angry. You have a shipment that gets destroyed. You have a pandemic that shuts you down. You have like whatever. You're talking patterns. I'm talking the things day in and day out, week after week, month after month that bother you. That is your intuition. Mm -hmm. And so taking the time to write down all the things that your intuition is saying, this isn't working. We can do better. That is strengthening your intuition. That is also getting you out of this habit of thinking about things instead of doing something about it. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is take that piece of paper and take a tack and nail it into your wall where you can see it and chip away at it. That's it. That's it. I'll tell you where I got lost as an entrepreneur. Okay. Um, it's kind of like, you know, if you have three different points in the triangle, you've got your purpose, Mm -hmm. what you, you know, what you're after going after. And then you've got two sets of responsibilities and you maybe feel a responsibility to the purpose, but you've got, uh, you got to show up and, and, you know, I have four boys, you got to show up and deliver for your family, right? You got to provide. Mm-hmm. And then you got the responsibilities of the business. And where I got really lost is I forgot some of my purpose because it felt really far away. Yeah. And then out of, uh, you know, I really committed myself to the work cause I got to show up for the family. What I, it started to do is lacked the, I wasn't present for my purpose. I wasn't present for my family because I was sitting here trying to figure out how to solve all of these problems. So what, what would you say to somebody that's in that sort of stretch, that kind of high stress, uh, moment, uh, where everybody's sort of waiting for you to deliver? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a major mistake to tie your purpose and your business performance to something related to your family. It's good. Because then you get mired in all of this crap with guilt and shame and not measuring up and (laughs) all of that stuff. Like don't do that to your family. Don't do it to yourself. Pursue a business because it, it fulfills you. Like if your business becomes a vehicle for something else, it's going to just create all kinds of mixed emotions. And so if you're sitting there because you've inherited a family business or like my husband, he went into the restaurant business because he had been in um, business development for software companies and he was always traveling and he had been, you know, kind of laid off in the first dot com thing. Then he went to another one, then he went to another one and he just didn't feel connected to what he was doing. And he thought if he could start a restaurant in the community, he would be around more. I mean, everybody running a restaurant laughing because you know the hours that you work and you know that you're gone every weekend. And he thought, you know, that maybe he'd be able to, you know, be present at at the boosters and coach the kids when they were little and all Mm -hmm. that stuff. And that did happen a little bit, but he started to spiral when the business started to fail because he not only felt like a failure in business, he felt like a failure as a father Mm -hmm. because so much of why he did it was tied up with providing. Yeah. So I would encourage you to go back to why you want to do this, because if your business becomes an obligation, it's not going to be as successful as it could be. It's not going to be fulfilling. You got to figure out how to find purpose for yourself because your kids are watching you. They feel your energy. They are getting messaging from you. And the best thing that you could model for your kids, I don't care if you're the mom or the dad, the best thing you could model is what it looks like to be an adult that is pursuing something that you care about and that is working hard through the ups and downs because that's what you want your kids to do. If it turns into an obligation and guilt and all this stuff, that's what you're modeling to your children. And so for any of you who may feel that, but you're, but, but I got to pay the bill, but I get it. But what I'm trying to get you to understand is that the more personally connected you are to the business for yourself, selfishly as an individual, because you need something that's driving you to feel successful and fulfilled and to wake up every day and have a sense of purpose in your life. If you can tap back into that, 
that is the single best business advice we can give you because it unlocks a different level of energy in you and a different level of focus in you and a different kind of, you like shift into a higher gear. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. One, two, you know, talking about purpose. I think uh, one of the things I'd, I, I, it would be really good to hear your perspective on and help everybody <clears throat> um, get maybe a, lay, a layer deeper to what you were just talking about. Because I think when I imagined purpose, it was something like, remember I said a couple seconds ago, I've, it, it was really far away. Mm -hmm. So the difference between purpose as a destination or something that you carry with you. Okay. I just want, I want to hear sort of like how you think about purpose. Uh, and maybe it's not a vision, right? Because that's something that seems far away that you're headed towards, but pur purpose is something you carry with you. You know, talk, talk to us a little bit about how you, how you see purpose, how you see us discovering it and how that sort of is a driver for us. Sure. So I'm going to bring another uh, word into this, passion, because people tend to conflate those two. Um, so let's start with passion. So passion to me is another word for energy. And... You can be passionate about anything because passion is just what brings you energy in your life. And the way to bring more passion into your work and into your life is to do the list I'm talking about, identify what the friction is, write down what you love doing, and try to spend a little bit more time every day dedicated to some of the things you like doing because it brings you energy. And if you think about the way people talk about passion, you're passionate about things that you like. I'm profoundly passionate about flowers and gardening and by deadheading. And I could talk to you for hours about dahlias and peonies and, you know, just, I don't know why. It just brings me a lot of energy. My husband is profoundly passionate about uh, telemark skiing. He could talk to you for hours about it loves to, to skin up the mountain and backcountry and all this stuff. Are you kidding me? That is like putting me in a morgue talking about that. So passion and bringing more passion is about energy and that is hardwired. You can't fake it. And so thinking about it from a business or a life perspective, where are the, what are the things that you do that naturally energize you and just insert a little bit more. Now, the way that that is different than purpose is I think about purpose, I think in a, I don't know. I, 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 do, I do understand what you're saying when you say it's like a directional signal. It's a, it's a thing, right, that's out there. But I believe everybody's purpose is exactly the same. Mm. I really do. I believe your purpose is to figure out what brings you individually more energy in your life that makes you come alive and then your purpose is to share yourself, your story, and that energy with the world. And whatever expression that is, whether it's the flowers that you grow, or it's the energy that you bring when you're skinning up the mountain with your buddies, or it is how you open up your retail store in the morning or greet customers coming in because of how it energizes you, or if it's the kindness that you show to a stranger because you know that everybody is trying to climb out of some hole because you're constantly doing it in your own life. Like sharing yourself, your unique story, your wisdom, your energy, that's your purpose. That's why we're all here. So good. I, I knew you, I knew your perspective would be illuminating on purpose. I think, um, you know, if you've got this, uh, you know, you've, you've got a platform at this, at this point. Yeah. Well, and, um, <laughs> I, I have to say, uh, you know, like you said, you know, took it or whatever I said, it took you 15 years to be an overnight success and people are, are sort of, um, you know, kind of discovering you and wh what is the thing that, um, like, what's the thing that is, sort of like what, what is the difference between maybe what got you here and then where you're headed and what, what is the thing that you're, you really want people to come away with when they've encountered you or the platform, what do you want people to kind of come away with? And is it different before than it will be or, or whatever? 
Does that make sense? Yeah. So there are a couple questions in there. I like compound questions. That's that's okay. Mm-hmm. I like breaking them apart because mm-hmm. I. That is one thing that I think is my genius, taking really complex topics mm-hmm. and just drilling it down to its essence and making it so simple and actionable that anybody could do it. And so I'll kind of answer them a little bit in reverse. So I want absolutely everybody that I interact with, whether it is somebody that sees a piece of content online or somebody that bumps into me in an airport or someone that listens to the podcast episode or a YouTube episode anywhere around the world, I want you to feel moved emotionally. And what that means by that is I want you to feel a little better than you did when you encountered the piece of content. And I want you to have one actionable thing or one idea or one new insight that you leave that interaction with. And that is how I move through life. And so that's number one, and I'm pretty maniacal about it. Mm -hmm. Um, Number two, talking about the kind of, how did you get to where you are? Because I literally went from giving this TEDx talk back in 2011 to, which was the first speech I had ever given to. That was the first one you've ever given? Yeah. If you watch that TEDx talk, which is now got like 31 million views and one of the top 20 in the world, um, you'll notice in the first minute, all of this like rash all over my neck that people get when they drink too much or they have anxiety. Oh, I, I was out of my mind anxious. And, um, I literally, um, forgot how to end the speech. I wasn't planning on talking about the five second rule. It was a total accident or intervention from God. I'd been using the five second rule for three years in secret. I didn't know why it worked. I had never told anybody but my husband about it. And I forgot how to end this little talk. And I look out on that stage and I have this blank stare. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, there's this thing I do. I call it the five second rule. The moment you have an instinct to act, you gotta move in five seconds or your brain will kill your instinct to move. Thank you very much. And I was so panic stricken, I gave out my email address. Something crazy happened. A year went by. I forgot about that. I went on with my life. Somebody put it online. Another year went by, 2014. It went viral within that year and people started to write to me at that email address. And so here I am working a job. I still have $800,000 liens on the house. My husband is leaving the restaurant business, a shell of himself, an alcoholic. Um, We are barely making the ends meet and I'm spending every night responding to strangers. Oh my gosh. About this five second rule thing. And they were writing to me about crazy stuff. I've lost a hundred pounds. I'm able to stay sober. I've doubled my business. I'm present with my kids. Like, why is this working? And I'm like, I have no idea. Like I got to figure this out. And so I took on a research project so I could answer emails from strangers. And then people started to call and ask me to speak. And I didn't know people made money doing this. So for the first year in 2014, I went to like six or seven women's conferences, was not paid a thing. And at the end of 2014, or maybe it was 13, I get the years mixed up. A woman came up to me after a talk at the Pennsylvania Women's Conference and said, hey, I was a speaker this morning. Can I ask you a question? And I'm like, sure. And I, I, I thought she was going to ask me about like, I don't know. And she goes, did you get your check yet? I'm like, check? People get paid for this? And she kind of took a pause. She's like, oh my God, I'm really sorry. Like, I just assume like you're in a really big room. I'm like, people get paid for this? I had no idea. I thought you had to be famous or an author or like a somebody. Like I was a nobody trying to pay my bills who had done a TEDx talk for free because my college roommate had recommended me to somebody because I had changed my job so many times. And 
They were offering two plane tickets and a night at a nice hotel in San Francisco. And when you have $800,000 in debt, that sounds like a vacation. So I'm like, exactly. okay, Chris, we're going to San Francisco. Let's do this. I had no idea what I was doing. And so all of this just took off. And I made myself this promise. And this is kind of one of those, this is another one of those one decision, you're one decision away from a different life. I had no idea what to charge. No idea. And if you have no idea what to charge for your services or for your consulting, you can do one of two things. You can either do a competitive analysis and try to figure it out and just push through the imposter syndrome, or you can try this strategy. No idea what to charge. So I made myself a promise. The next time somebody calls, just count five, four, three, two, one and pause and then say, what's your budget? And then count five, four, three, two, one, pause and say, normally I'm double. So two weeks later, the phone rings. It's a guy named Darren Powell, who has a whole nother crazy story. That's just yet a whole nother, you know, synchronicity moment in his life and my life intersecting at exactly the right time. And he says, yeah, I'm calling because, uh, my wife is a huge fan of yours. She's seen your TED talk on Facebook and she works for a company called Jay Hilburn, which is a men's custom suiting company. And they'd like to bring in an outside speaker for their sales conference. By the way, I had no idea what any of this meant. And he says, would you be available to come give a keynote in August? I'm like, okay, five, four, three, two, one. What's your budget? He said $10,000. I dropped the fucking phone. I had no idea. That was three months of our mortgage. I forgot the second part. I was so blown away that, that, that I, I pick up the phone. I'm like, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I can be there. I can be there. I can be there. And I was so, I felt so unworthy of that kind of money that I then made a second decision that changed everything. I figured to be able to be paid that much money, I better have a presentation that looks good. So I spent half of the money. I mean, get this into your brain, half of the money. My husband is now not working. I am somehow holding down the Ford. We've got liens on the house. I've got enough money to pay the mortgage for three months coming in out of nowhere. This is like a gift from God. And I take half of it and spend it on a PowerPoint presentation with a graphic designer so that I could get on that stage and feel like I was worthy of being there. And it was one of the best decisions I have ever made because when you make an investment like that, it forces you to prepare. And so there are these moments in your life that get teed up. It's like an at-bat moment. And when I stepped on that stage, I freaking crop dusted that place with motivation. I was ready. And it changed the rest of my life. And so Darren came up to me and said, I've been in this business 20 years. You are probably one of the top three speakers I've ever seen in my life. And you're single-handedly the best female keynote speaker I've ever heard. Who runs your business? And I said, you do. And he's run it ever since. And so I went on to do 47 speeches that year, and then it was 99, and then it was 115, and it allowed me to pay back all of our debt. It allowed me to take everything, like I literally, everything that came in, I put 50% towards paying off bills. And so, you know, I am- Insert standing ovation here. Yeah. <laughs> That's like pretty awesome. I literally, it came out of nowhere and I took it so seriously. And I think this is one of the things that really drives me. I'm still so close to breakdown in terms of that experience Yeah, that I relate to the headaches and heartaches and overwhelm that normal people like you and me and you listening to us are experiencing every single day. And that's who I'm talking to every day. And even though, you know, I've solved the money part, I still have all kinds of struggles in my life. 
whether it's people that I love dying or losing people to addiction or despair, or it's kids struggling with anxiety, or it's fighting with my husband about things or, and so I never, ever, ever get too far away from the fact that life can be a struggle and it's also the most extraordinary, beautiful gift. And so how do you kind of ride the wave of it? And one thing that I will tell you is that um, all along the way, we've talked a lot about intuition. I've paid very close attention to my intuition because my intuition typically doesn't, <laughs> doesn't come in positive ways. My intuition is negative. I can't help it. Like I get frustrated about things or I'm jealous. And when I get frustrated about things or I'm jealous of other people, that to me is blocked desire because you can't be jealous of something you don't want. Yeah. And so you got to unpack those moments of jealousy. What is it? Because for me, you know, when I was really struggling financially, I was so jealous of my friends who has, whose husbands worked and who didn't have to work and who were renovating their kitchens. And meanwhile, I've got collections agency callings and bills piled high. I didn't want a new kitchen. I wanted the peace that I perceived that they had. And when you unpack your jealousy, it becomes a roadmap to where you need to pivot and where you need to go to work. And so every single business decision that I've made has been a moment where I've either noticed somebody and I've been slightly jealous of what they're doing and I've made a pivot. Like I remember with social media, when I first stumbled on Gary Vaynerchuk, um, God, it was probably six years ago. I was jealous because he was doing what I kind of felt this friction, but I couldn't put my finger on because as the speaking career took off, notice again, the piece that you really love. I noticed that it wasn't being on stage that I loved. It was what happened after. It was bumping into people walking to the airport. It was yeah. bumping into people that came up and said, oh my God, I saw a YouTube video and I used it with my kid and it helped with their anxiety. And it wasn't the accolades. It was the information and the data that, that it was really helping somebody mm -hmm. that, that fueled me. And it was also these intimate conversations with people that I felt like this is what should be shared. And so I hired two people to follow me around and just film everything. And that changed our social media strategy. And then, um, I started to have this other kind of friction. Like I really want to be doing more audio stuff. I really love the audio format and podcasting was getting out. And so we ended up pivoting and starting to do more original productions for Audible. So a lot of people don't realize this, but you look at my business from the outside and you go, oh, she writes books. She hosts podcasts. She's a motivational speaker. Nobody knows that I have a production studio called 143 Studios. And we partner with companies like Ulta Beauty, Starbucks, JP Morgan, LinkedIn. We create custom original content that is science and research back to address particular behavior change or mindset issues that is entertaining and actionable. Um, we have the number one course on LinkedIn out of all the courses in the world on the science of confidence. We've done six number one original audiobook releases that Audible uh, hired our company to create for them and produce for them. Um, I'm very proud of the work that we've done with Starbucks and 194,000 employees. And we are in the middle of, it'll already be public by the time that you're listening to this, rolling out a nationwide campaign with Ulta Beauty and 50,000 associates called the Joy Project, which is a training curriculum where we're teaching 50,000 associates to really silence their inner critic and then pass the joy forward to the people that they interact with every single day that go into the stores and look in the mirror and go, I hate this. I hate this about myself and actually interrupt that criticism and insert something that is inspiring and yet will actually land. Cause when you say to somebody who's criticizing their appearance, you're beautiful. The person's like, no, I'm not. Like I, you, you, that, that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so you can try different strategies. And so that's a massive part of our business. We also have had more than a million people take free courses online. We do paid uh, programs where like, there's so much that our company is doing behind the scenes, but all that most people see is 
where my commitment is, which is really all the free content yeah. that we put out every single day. We're doing almost 70 pieces of content every week on social media. That's incredible. We're averaging 800,000 watch hours a month on YouTube. 800,000 watch hours a month. Well, you know what I tapped into? Hope. Mm. And I think that what a great mentor does is it allows you to borrow confidence. Yeah. And so our brand is a unwavering stand in your ability to do the work, to create a better life for yourself, just unwavering. And I am unwavering in my belief because I have too much evidence based on the size of our audience that there is somebody that is dealing with the exact same situation somewhere in the world that you are dealing with. And if they were able to slowly, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, wake up and chip away at it, so can you. I love that. And that that definitely is, hope is required there. Mm -hmm. It's so good. Well, we've talked about a lot of things. I uh, I had one more thing that I wanted to ask because I was like I, I was like if I could have like a, a a a box a package with an open top that was like this is the gift that if if I could just slide it over and be like what gift would you put into that box you know what's the one thing that you would say that you would you would give as a gift to everybody listening what would that be It's definitely the five second rule I mean there's a ton of different tools that I can teach people but without you being able to push yourself through self-doubt, procrastination, anxiety, the heaviness of depression, without you being able in a moment when you're alone to do that for yourself, nothing's gonna change because no one's coming to do it for you. And I can inspire, empower, educate and encourage you all day long, and I will. But when I'm done talking, it's up to you to push yourself to take action. And this simple little countdown technique, five, four, three, two, one, we didn't discuss the science at all, but trust me when I tell you, you start counting backwards, it works. And the reason why it works is because of this. The second you decide to start counting, You've made a decision to do something different. And the act of saying five, four, three, two, one is the first domino. Counting backwards is an action. And so that thing that you have been thinking about, whether it's going to the gym or making that phone call or getting out of bed or walking away from that drink or having the conversation with the person that works for you, it all of a sudden moved from a thought to a decision to the first action, and now you've tapped into momentum in a new direction. That's why it works. And what a gift. What a gift. Well, we've talked uh, a lot about a lot that is kind of what you do. We want to know a little bit more about who you are, so I have some rapid-fire questions. Oh, cool. Okay. Ask. All right, what's the weirdest situation where you've applied the five second rule? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I was standing on stage uh, in front of a, about, probably about 400 small business owners. Uh -huh. And I was giving a speech. And thank God I was wearing a long black skirt and high top tennis shoes because I sneezed. <laughs> And when I sneezed, having had three children and run four marathons, I literally leaked. Like I was like, it happens, you know, it happens to women and it leaked to the extent that it hit my ankles. And I was so mortified and everybody's staring at me. I'm in the middle of the speech. I've just sneezed and I just, I, I, I didn't know what to do. So I just started counting backwards five, four, three, two, silently to myself, which allowed me to compose myself. And I kept on talking. Oh man. You were not expecting that. No, that is awesome though. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, what's one habit that you still struggle to change even with the five second rule? Getting out of bed. Okay. Getting out of bed. Well, how would uh, Mel Robbins answer the infamous question, what's your greatest weakness? I think my greatest weakness is I don't consider what I do work. So I work too much. Okay. Well, what's the most unusual skill you possess that people don't know about? I am crazy flexible and I can get into all kinds of weird, like handstands and balances and weird stuff like that. Okay. What's your guilty pleasure? Uh, sex in the afternoon with my husband. Okay. Well, should it be a guilty that, pleasure? I don't, I don't even know if that's a guilty that pleasure. Is. I don't know. But guilty sounds naughty and kind of fun. Okay. Right, and there you, know. you go. Well, our therapist, here's, here's a great tip, everybody. Our, our, uh, I had a, I interviewed this, this, uh, sex expert sex with Emily. I mean, we've been married 29 years. I mean, you got to mix things up. And so she literally <laughs> said, start texting each other and make dates in the afternoon. Like, Hey, in between calls, two o'clock, you free? I'm free. Should we meet up? Like, it's kind of fun. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Too much information. It's a good it's a business podcast. Hey, I mean, <laughs> come on now. We said we wanted to get to know you. Uh, what's uh, your morning routine in three words? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. That's your morning routine. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay. It's a, it's the subject of the a huge project we're working on. <clears throat> Okay. And those are all habits, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. All right. Well, we, we, we wait with bated <laughs> breath. Uh, what it could be get ass bed or something like, you know. <laughs> get get, get out of, up. Get out of. Get up, woman. Get out of bed. Get up, woman. All right. Uh, what book's on your nightstand right now? Oh, I have that Tower of Guilt. They call it that in the publishing industry. You know. The where, pile. Of, yeah, the pile of yeah. guilt. I don't even know what's in it, honestly. I don't. It's just there. Yes, but I do. Um, do you have I a do, favorite recent read? Uh, yeah. What the heck was it? It was like, see, I when I read, I read so much academic crap that for work and research studies and that kind of stuff that when I read, I want a novel. I want to lose myself in a book. And I can't remember what the last one was that I just... <laughs> but something I'd be probably embarrassed to admit that I read. Um, but I do have a book that I read every day when I'm home and it is the book of awakening. It's okay. a, like a, it's by Mark Nepo. He wrote it when he was going through cancer and it's like these two page reflections on life and it's by date. And I just find it a really grounding thing. Oh, I love that. Uh, what are you high-fiving yourself about in this season of life? Hmm. The amount of work that I've done in the last three years to heal my nervous system mm. and stop the obsession with being busy and racing around all the time and to just learn how to be present. Love that. Uh, what's one thing that you'd tell your younger self? I wouldn't. Well, what's next for what Mel Robbins? What's next? We're launching a podcast network. Okay. And an audio and publishing imprint. So new shows rolling out. We're opening production studios in Boston and a new office space for our employees. And I live in Southern Vermont. And one of the reasons why I really wanted to do that is because my success was born out of crisis. Mm -hmm. And when your success is born out of crisis, you got to pay your bills. You got to like get the liens off the house, you can become addicted to saying yes to everything. And you can confuse busyness with success. Mm -hmm. And because I love what I do, that is a recipe for disaster. And um, while I would not change a thing, I do hate the fact that the success came at a price and I really missed a lot of my daughter's high school and I did not want to do that with our son. And so um, I am taking very strategic steps to separate work from my life. And to give you an indication of just how much I love my work, I needed a three hour drive 
between the studio space and my house so that I would well really stop and go, hmm, is this necessary? Yeah. And so that I could separate my home from being the place where all work gets done. Yeah. And so that I had better boundaries and that the amazing team of people that work for us had a fabulous place to be. And um, I'm really excited about it. That's good. Well, we've got, uh, I, you know, there's kind of like a stay tuned moment because we're going to ask you some questions that everybody, uh, everybody amazing. sent in. But I want to say one thing to kind of close this part of the conversation. Your uh, authenticity and kind of your effervescence is really contagious. Oh. And, um, you know, there were a couple times, I'd say in this conversation where what you said, you know, it's really resonated with me and I know it'll resonate with a lot of others that are listening. So I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, thanks for doing what you do. Thanks for coming. Thanks for giving. And, um, you know, we just, I would just say, you know, for everybody here and everybody listening, thanks for, thanks for keeping going. Well, thank you. Appreciate you a ton. Thank you. I appreciate no you. Problems.